Many modern neurologists think the best way to treat MS is to diagnose it early and start highly effective disease-modifying therapy as soon as possible, even accepting the risk of immunosuppressive medications, which could be outweighed by the potential benefits of controlling the disease early on. But these drugs have been around for a while, so what exactly happened to people who took that advice? Well, this French study analyzed a database and seeks to answer that exact question, looking at people who started stronger medications earlier in the disease and following them for many years. Are they still doing well or did they go on to develop worsening disability and progressive MS? And what were the predictors of developing secondary progressive MS many years later? Let's look at the results. So this is the SPAM study, secondary progression despite early highly active treatment in MS. In other words, people who got the better drugs early in the disease who went on to develop secondary progressive MS years later and what predicted that. This is a retrospective study from a French MS database. It's not a randomized trial. Obviously, it's not random in the real world who gets what medication, so there could be various biases. They do try to correct for some of the confounders. Of course, the results should be considered not definitive. I give credit to first author Mikhail Cohen for this very nice publication. So they looked at people with relapsing onset MS, not primary progressive MS, who started highly active therapy, the better medications, within five years of onset of the disease. And five years is a long time. A lot of people are getting these stronger drugs within six months of getting diagnosed with MS. These are the medications they consider to be highly active. Tysabri, Gelenia, Mavenclad, Lemtrada, Novantrone, and the B-cell depleting or anti-CD20 drugs, Rituximab and Ocrevus. Now, in my opinion, the drug Gelenia stands out. This is a once a day pill for MS because many people, including myself, would consider it to be moderately effective, probably less effective than a lot of these other medications, though they haven't really been compared in head-to-head -head trials. They also looked at people with lower disability with an EDSS less than four. This is expanded disability status scale, a measure of disability in MS research, and less than four essentially means no major mobility difficulties. These are the baseline characteristics of people in the study. So out of 72,874 people with MS in the database, only 2,237 met this criteria. Many of them could have had MS for a long time. A lot of these medications weren't on the market when they were diagnosed. Many of them took different medications. And as time goes forward, more and more people would meet the criteria for this sort of study. The mean age was 31.6, 70.5% were women, and the median EDSS was only two, which is low. So most of these people did not have significant disabilities. And the mean disease duration prior to starting highly active therapy was only 2.1 years. So they were started on it early in the disease. And some did receive other medications prior to the highly active therapy. It was actually more than 60%. So it wasn't necessarily the first line therapy, but it was started relatively early in the disease. The number who had two or more relapses in the last two years was 65.8% and 60.1% had gadolinium enhancing or active lesions on MRI. So these were people early in the disease, primarily with low disability, but they still had active inflammatory MS. It's not like they had quiet disease prior to starting these medications. Almost everyone in the study received one of these three drugs, Gelenia, Tysabri, or Ocrevus. So Tysabri was the most popular, 48.1% got Tysabri. 36.2% got Gelenia, again, maybe not really a highly active therapy, and 13.7% got Ocrevus. A small number received Rituximab or Mavenclad, and one person received Lemtrada, and one person received Kisimta, but again, the data are dominated by these three medications. They looked at the raw results, but they also adjusted for these factors which confounded with progressive disability, including gender, age at disease onset, age at treatment initiation and number of relapses during the two years prior to treatment, baseline EDSS score, the type of first relapse, such as getting weakness or optic neuritis, and the interval between the first and second attack. 
And here are the results. So what you're looking at is the cumulative probability of three different outcomes. So cumulative probability on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And over 10 years, more and more people reach these outcomes. The first, the gray line, is secondary progressive MS. Many people with relapsing MS remain stable, but others, after many years, they could stop having relapses, stop developing new lesions on MRI, but they may slowly insist insidiously get worse. The most common symptoms that worsen would be worsening mobility, worsening tremor, and sometimes worsening cognitive function. But even after 10 years, only 8% develop secondary progressive MS. That is quite low, much lower than what has been reported in historical studies. So that looks pretty good. The next outcome was PIRA, or progression independent of relapse activity. These are people with relapsing MS who don't have a relapse, but they still have some worsening of disability, not necessarily getting a formal diagnosis of secondary progressive MS. And it's been recognized as being increasingly common even in young people with relapsing MS and low disability. And after 10 years, 22%, the yellow line, did have PIRA at some point, some progression of disability at some point. They also looked at PIA. This is progression independent of activity, all activity, both relapses and new MRI lesions. So after 10 years, 11% had some progression of disability despite no relapse and no new lesions on MRI. So that looks very good. That's extremely optimistic, though it's a highly cherry-picked cohort. It's people who have relapsing onset MS, not progressive onset MS, people who were treated with stronger medications earlier in the disease, and have had relatively low disability, EDSS less than four, but they are doing surprisingly well. But some people did develop secondary progressive MS, and here are the predictors of that outcome. On the left is univariate analysis, looking at the raw data, not correcting for confounders. And on the right is multivariate analysis, correcting for the confounders I showed you earlier, but it doesn't end up making much of a difference, so we'll just focus on the left-hand column. The first is gender. The women did a little bit better, with an odds ratio of 0.67 in other words, a 33% reduced risk of SPMS compared to men. Younger people tended to do better. Those who were less than 30 at baseline at the beginning prior to getting the highly active therapy, those who were 30 to 40 had a 2.38 fold increased risk of SPMS. Those who were 40 to 50 had a roughly five fold increased risk. And those above 50 had a roughly six fold increased risk. And this has been reported before advanced age in MS is associated with more disability. So although it looks great for the younger people, it wasn't quite as favorable for people who are older when they started these medications. Relapses did matter, although many people think relapses are less important and it's all about PIRA, progression independent of relapse activity. The number of relapses in the two years prior to starting these medications did correlate with future development of secondary progressive MS. Compared to people who had no relapses in the last few years, those who had one, two, or three or more relapses had a roughly two to four fold increased risk of future development of secondary progressive MS, so relapses do seem to matter. And the article looked closely at relapse-associated worsening, or RA, which is increased disability associated directly with a relapse. And it was rare. Only 1.8% in this study had RA, or relapse-associated worsening. However, more people had activity-associated worsening, in other words, worsening due to a relapse or associated with a new or active MRI lesion, which was actually 6.2%. That was much more common than relapse-associated worsening. And they found that relapse-associated worsening after starting therapy did make a difference. So if they looked at early raw, in other words, having relapse-associated worsening within two years of starting the highly active therapy, that was associated with a 4.82-fold increased risk of future development of secondary progressive MS, p-value highly statistically significant at 0 0.007. But also later RA, in other words, more than two years after starting the therapy, 
also predicted SPMS with a hazard ratio of 3.62. In other words, 3.62 fold increased risk of SPMS. So it seems that relapses both prior to and after the start of therapy do matter, do correlate with SPMS. Disability at the beginning of the study also predicted SPMS. Those who had an EDSS of zero, completely normal, no neurological disability associated with MS, had an incredibly good prognosis, but those who had some disability, EDSS 1 to 3.5, had an eight-fold increased risk of SPMS compared to those with an EDSS of zero, and those with an EDSS ESS of exactly four had a roughly 50-fold increased risk. So the people who were diagnosed very early with no disability simply do great after taking these highly active therapies. They also looked at the correlation between PIRA and secondary progressive MS, and they were highly correlated, which makes sense because they're similar concepts of progressive disability. Those who had no PIRA, the purple line, had very low rates of SPMS. Those who had early PIRA shortly after getting getting the highly active therapy had the highest rates of SPMS approaching 50% over 10 years, and those who developed PIRA later had intermediate rates of SPMS. The same was true of PIA. Again, this is having progression of disability despite not having a relapse and not having a new or active lesion. Those with PIA had appreciable rates of SPMS. Those without PIA had virtually no risk of SPMS. So overall, I think the data look great and are very optimistic showing that people who have relapsing MS, who are treated early in the disease, who have low disability at baseline, especially if they're somewhat younger and they're getting highly active therapy, tend to have a relatively good prognosis. Now, of course, you could criticize the study in certain ways. One is that SPMS is a little bit of a subjective outcome. It can be difficult to recognize the transition to SPMS, which is often gradual and recognized retrospectively, and it's hard to appreciate progression in someone who has low disability overall. Someone with an EDSS of two or three simply might not complain that much to their doctor because they can still get around okay, and they really may not complain about subtle changes in symptoms, even though they are present and can be measured objectively. Another thing you could say is, hey, this is only 10 years of follow-up, and a lot of these people were 30 years old at baseline, what about after 20 or 30 years when a lot of these people are 60, 70, or 80 years old? Certainly, we can't guarantee a very long-term good prognosis just based on 10 years of data, and that's true. In terms of the outcomes, I think better than SPMS would be specific disability milestones like proportion who reach EDSS of 3 or 3.5 or 4, or even better, having something like the MS functional component composite, which is a composite outcome looking at different metrics, which better represents true disability in MS, in my opinion, and generally speaking, has stronger statistical power. Nonetheless, I think these people in this study are doing quite well, definitely much better than natural history controls. I can assure you that's true. I'd like to see the results of two ongoing randomized trials, treat MS and deliver MS, which plan to test highly active therapy therapies versus more conservative options earlier in the disease and see if the benefit of these medications can be proven in a randomized trial. If you actually took one of these stronger medications shortly after diagnosis, I'd love to know how are you doing so far? Do you think it was worth the potentially increased risks of these medications? And let me know if you have ideas for other videos.